So, okay, I am live. I am live on Facebook and I'm live on Instagram. How are you peoples? I am so happy to be here with you. It has been quite an interesting week, hasn't it? And I have noticed that a bunch of the people that I talk to, well, there's only one person besides me so far on Facebook. Oh, 15. Okay, we're getting there. But uh, yeah, how was your week? Was it weird? Most people's weeks are quite weird these days, I think, because we're in the middle of the unfolding of uh, something completely unknowable. Of course, we always have been since we were uh, existed as a species, and yet it always feels new and fresh, the confusion and the panic. <laughs> okay, we've got a bunch of peeps here now, so I am going to jump in. So today I'm doing kind of a special gathering room because I've had contact with a lot of people through coaching and because I'm doing interviews for my new book. And I've noticed this surge of a particular dilemma for a lot of people. And the surge takes the form of feeling overwhelmed. And I, I hear a lot of people saying, I don't know what to prioritize. And I, it's something I've never heard from a lot of people at the same time in the same way before ever. And I think it's because we are at this phase of people seeing maybe the light on the horizon. We may be coming out of the pandemic lockdowns. I know some places are worse than ever, but a lot of people are getting vaccinated. A lot of people are seeing their old restaurants and things opening up. They're thinking about going back to the gym and their jobs and their interactions with friends and family. Ooh with whom they may or may not want to interact after a year of shutdown, right? It's all, and so the, the way we lived under COVID gave us all these new options for how we do our lives. And then the way we lived before COVID had all these infinite options about how to do our lives. And now they're all sort of smashing together. And I think this is why people are feeling, they, they've been telling me they feel overwhelmed and paralyzed because they don't know what to do first or in what order to do things. And this is really interesting for me because when I am confronted with a lot of options like this, first of all, I know what's happening. There's a, an attention bottleneck in the brain that makes it so that if we have too many targets, we can't focus on anything. Like the reason deer and zebra and so forth run in herds, seems like they'd be easier to catch when they're pooled together, but no, in the predator's brain, if it sees one zebra, it can go after it with great focus. But if there are a hundred zebra, it kind of goes, oh, what, 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 what? And there's a place in the brain where it bottlenecks and the animal, the predator really literally can't move. They get paralyzed because there are too many zebra to kill, right? So this is what's happening to a lot of people right now. And that I am very interested in this because I have a fix for it. And I've been living the fix for a long time. And it's when I learned about the brain and how creativity works that I stopped feeling overwhelmed and paralyzed. I remember feeling overwhelmed and paralyzed all the time. If you pick up a journal that I wrote in anytime before like 19, well, before 2000, it will start out with, I don't know what to do. I have so much to do. I don't know what to do first. I don't know what to do next. I'm paralyzed. I'm overwhelmed. And I came up with ways of, you know, taking it slowly and all that. But then I kind of hit on a different identity uh, shift. It, I, it, it happened when I learned how to go from the left side of my brain, which is procedural, to turn on the right side of my brain, which is creative. And so is yours. And our entire modern culture, you know, yesterday somebody said, um, our culture is perfectionistic. I said that and someone said, well, what about Chinese culture? It's even more perfectionistic. I literally mean any mo modern culture because all the, and by modern, I mean, the things that were prejudicially called civilized, like not tribal peoples, not traditional peoples, but anybody who's sort of in the modern socioeconomic model, that pushes us to do things on the left sides of our brain, right? Procedural, procedural, procedural. And if we can understand something that way, we don't feel overwhelmed. But nature doesn't do it like that. Only societies do it like that. In nature, when you're confronted with a lot of options, the way out of the panic, the way out of the overwhelm, the way out of the paralysis 
is what I call the creativity mindset is learning how to literally like flip a switch and go from a procedural mindset into a creativity mindset. So I'm actually doing a course on this. I've mentioned it before. It's starting in June. It's a six week course and it's um, there's more information on my website, but it's all about how to cope with this point in your life by going to the creativity mindset and then using it to invent a whole new way of living now that we have this incredible opportunity between what used to be and what is coming next. So if you have questions about the course, I'm doing a live Q&A Zoom call on Tuesday, June 1st. So you can ask your questions and of course that's all free. So bring your questions about the creativity mindset and your specific kind of overwhelm because I won't be able to answer them all today. But that said, let's go into my favorite topic here. So. Think about something in your own life where you feel pressured, overwhelmed, and maybe paralyzed, or maybe just really reluctant to go forward. For a lot of people, what I'm hearing is it's going back to their old jobs and going back to their old relationship patterns. So there, let's focus on the job thing first, because it's what you do in a day. A lot of people had to dramatically shift what they did in a typical day when the pandemic struck. And everybody felt this as a loss and a, well, I can't say everybody, but a lot of people felt this as a loss and as terrifying. And now they're saying, guess what? Soon you'll be going back to what you were doing before you got so lost and terrified. And people are feeling lost and terrified because the left side of the brain, when presented with any unfamiliar information or situation will automatically turn on the fear circuits. So let me explain this in the terms of Jill Bolte-Taylor, the Harvard neuroanatomist whose book, Whole Brain Living has just come out and it's like phenomenal, it's crazy, it's so good. So what she says is we basically have two brains and there are different layers of the brain. You've got the part that responds to pure emotion and then you've got the part that can go into sort of higher order thinking. So cognition and, and creativity and all that. But the cognition, is on the left side of the brain and the creativity is on the right side. So underneath, so you have this little bit in the left side of your brain and its whole job, we call it the inner, inner lizard in my coaching stuff because it's called the reptile brain, but it's specifically on the left side. Reptiles evolved it and mammals all have it. We sort of piled brain on top of it. When confronted with anything unfamiliar, this brain says, Alert, alert, everything's wrong. Okay, we don't know what's happening, so we're gonna go in immediately into fight or flight. Now wrapped around that on the left side of your brain is a procedural part that says, wait, wait, wait. And, and by the way, Jill Bolte-Taylor, who, who does all this fabulous brain anatomy, she suggests giving a name to each of the four parts of the brain I'm gonna talk to you about. So the first one, I it, it's your inner lizard. Um, mine is called Dolores because she's very sad all the time. And that's one of the meanings of Dolores. And uh, she just is terrified by everything and wants to hide under the bed all the time. On top of that is the part of the brain that says, no, 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 I will take things in hand. I call this part of my brain Sarge. It used to be called Fang because it was it was just like, Arr, I will go do everything. Arr, and I, I don't care if it hurts you. Arr, speaking of me. So now it's Sarge, it's just like, yo, kid, it says to Dolores, come on, you can do this. We're gonna put things, we're gonna get things done. We're gonna go by the way things are organized and the things we've been taught our whole lives, we're gonna, yes, we're gonna go fill out the tax forms and send them to the IRS and not be afraid, darn it. And so Dolores is like, all right, but I'm really not happy with it. And Sarge is like, it's okay, we can get it done. I'll give you a break afterwards. So that's the way most of us work all the time. And because culture sends us to those two solutions almost all the time and not to the right side of the brain, the other two sides don't get as much use. So on the underside, so we had the little underside over here, Dolores, the panicky one. So name your panicky one and then name your Sarge who gets things done, even though things aren't great. Now on the other side of the brain, there's a little creative part and when it's confronted with something unfamiliar, it goes, ooh, what can I make of this? 
And it's what um, builds things. When you're a little kid, it, it, our little Lila, you know, she's eight months old now. And she just, you give her a basket of things and she's just like, oh, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Because she doesn't, the fear circuit doesn't turn on for her. The creativity circuit turns on for her because she's had very little trauma so far in her life. So, and I hope she never does. Anyway, Jill Bolte Taylor, I was listening to her book and she said, um, my, uh, you're going to have to name your create your this creative part of you, the little kid creative part that does things for fun and joy and laughter. And I said, I'm going to call mine pig pen after the little character in the peanuts cartoon who would just, he'd walk around in a little cloud of dirt would follow him everywhere. And everywhere he went, there were messes because let me tell you, when I get creative, whether it's writing or art or whatever else I happen to be making, cooking, whatever, I leave a trail of messiness. So I said, okay, I'm going to call this part of my brain pig pen. And then Jill Bolte Taylor on the book says, I call this part of my brain pig pen after the character in Peanuts. So both Jill Bolte Taylor and I have pig pen as our playful um, underside on the right. Now, this is the cool. So uh, Jill Bolte Taylor says, Dolores, the sad, scared one is number one. Um, Sarge, the one who takes charge of things procedurally is, is character two. Character three is the little pig pen. Yay, I'm gonna play and have fun person. And on top of that, you guys, is what she calls character four. And this is the part of us that perceives reality in a completely different way. If you read my book, Finding Your Way in a Wild and World, I talked to a bunch of uh, really reputable shamans and healers and people who do magical things. And every one of them was going into the creativity mindset to do magic. So I called it wordlessness because the right side of the brain doesn't have words. And then oneness because there's no sense of being separated from the rest of the universe when this part of the brain is turned on. There's a sense of being continuous with all things. There's a sense of deep empathy and love. There's a sense of bliss. And if you have any spiritually spiritual tendencies at all, you'd basically call it the presence of the divine, the presence of God. And this fourth character of the brain lives there. So to give a name to that, I call myself with a capital S because it's who I think I really am and it's who I think we really are. And the other parts of the brain are wonderful to play with if you're staying in that side of your brain. So around the year 2000, I'd done enough meditation and I'd learned enough brain hacks, which is what I'm gonna teach in this six week course um, in June, practical wayfinding. Um, I learned brain hacks for getting out of the left and into the right. So when I, I'm confronted, like I look at, oh, okay, things are changing. There are a lot of opportunities. I, I could travel again, what's gonna happen? And the left side of my brain starts to panic. Oh, I don't like this, it's unfamiliar. And immediately I use a brain hack and I switch on the right side of my brain. And the first thing is pig pen looks at all the options and says, ooh, what will we make? Let's make something. And then if I get still, I make a lot of messes, first of all. And then if I, got, I get still and quiet, the self part of me comes on and says, oh, this is what we came here to do. This is being able to get our hands in the clay of material reality at a time when the, the divine inventiveness can be brought to bear on the situation. This is the time you make great leaps forward in your soul, in your mind, in technology, in whatever it is you make. This is the opportunity for us to just go big. And so it's almost like learning to shift into the right side of our brains. It, it, Eckhart Tolle calls it our first mission in life. It's to awaken. If we're ever going to save this world, we're going to have to wake up first because there's no way that people who are lost can get each other on course, right? If we're going to get ourselves back from the brink of destruction, we have to awaken. And the second thing is to express what we feel and understand as we awaken through creation. 
And that's how we're going to make the next phase of our lives. That's how we're going to do this. Not by going back to the old order, not by panicking and trying to do things right because there is no right, but by switching into the part of the brain that goes, ooh, fun. And then, oh, yeah. And then we can use the left hemisphere to do all of its wonderful cognitive things and all of its careful, we, we can't go too far on this, like the left side of the brain is useful. You, you may have heard me say the mind, and I'll say now the left hemisphere is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. So um, anytime you laugh at a joke, anytime you're in awe at um, a landscape or a movie or, uh, any, or a child, anytime you are experiencing the joy of things with your senses and not thinking about past or future, you are turning on the right side of your brain. There are a lot of ways to do it, but I'll teach you just one now. Make a list of 25 things you love with your senses. So five things you love to hear, five things you love to see, five things you love to smell, five things you love to taste, and five things you love to touch. And make that list, and while you're making the list, watch, everything will get quieter. You'll be less afraid, you'll be more joyful, and then creativity starts to slide in because it's ooh, it's like water. It flows into any opening that we give it. So that is my um, cure for overwhelm. And it's not what people usually think. It's not organization. It's creativity. And it's really, really powerful and effective. Okay. So now I'm going over to the questions and answers part of the gathering room. Okay, here we go. Ah, so, mm. oh, we got our first ever question from YouTube. This is from Joanna Whitlock. She says, I keep asking myself what the right thing to do is. I seem to have lost myself in this. To the left side of your brain, it feels like that. But I really like you to get calm, do that little exercise I said with getting the sensory details of life present in your mind without past or future and realize that you can find yourself in this. We are on a threshold, you know, we're between one thing and another thing. And thresholds are very weird because we're not in one thing. We're not in one identity and out of another. We're sort of both or neither. And that means that we feel lost and we feel like we've lost ourselves. But what we've really lost is the old way we used to do things. And what we stand to gain is this whole creative and divine um, way of being, way of thinking, way of seeing that brings us the joy we're meant to feel. So you turn that around and see if you can write out three or four ways in which you are actually finding yourself in this. And thank you for your comment. Okay. Um, Anne says, my question is how to deal with people that I haven't seen in a long time. I feel that I'm not ready to go forth into society and mingle with extended family and friends. What ways can I deal with this overwhelming fear of getting back into the social routines? Exactly the same thing. You're gonna, you're going to get calm, you're gonna get quiet, and you're gonna treat almost, you, you need to treat yourself with the love and consideration you would give a little child. It's really lovely to have a very happy and curious eight month old around because it makes us remember us in our house here. <laughs> oh, what we were like, like what it's like to be that way. Maybe we haven't thought that for since we were eight months old. But when you get there, you your brain naturally gravitate towards what uh, gravitates toward what you love. Now, what happens when you go into the company of other people is you're going to have that part of your true nature, looking at my integrity book again, Nature is going to run into culture. Culture means any kind of pressure people put on you to act a certain way, right? And if your nature is to be quiet and introspective and thoughtful, and you force yourself to be extroverted and polite, oh, you split from your integrity and, and it feels really horrible. So the first thing you need to do is say, I'm going to be true to myself, even when I go among other people. Another thing is you might want to prune the tree a bit. There may be some people that you don't really benefit from having in your life. And if you're selling your happiness to be polite to those people, that's a really bad trade. Like, look, I'll give you this time being uncomfortable and miserable, but all you have to give up for it is your one chance at life. 
Uh, no, for me, it's worth offending a few people. If you have to say, I'd rather limit the time with you. So sit down and if, you, if you're going to be with other people, write their names and then go inside and look honestly at how much time you want to spend with this person or these people. And I, I find out a lot that people, um, like they think they're sick of their partner. But when I say, how much time do you want to spend communing with your partner every day? They say two hours, but I'm tired of it after that. Well, two hours is a lot of time if you're in deep focused communion. So if they know they don't have to go over that, they've got the boundaries in place. Okay, and creating boundaries is part of creativity. So then you think of creative ways to be happy with these people. Like go in and, um, you know, I last week I was referring to how I used to try to cook with my children and I'm terrible at cooking and didn't like it. Then I started painting with them. And now, uh, so my older kids do this and now Lila is sitting next to me in a high chair holding a paintbrush <laughs> and really fascinated by what I'm painting. So I found a way to be with children where I'm still in my creative playful self. And guess what? They love it because they're in their creative playful selves and they don't wanna be forced into cultural politeness either. So someone's, Ada says, yes, oh my God, I've, I've been living in fear of failure mode and analysis paralysis for years and I'm so tired of it. I'm trying to make time for creativity in hopes that it wakes up my finding my path. Yeah, it's really hard to for somebody who's been trained and trained and trained. Remember in the brain, what wires, what fires together, wires together. So every time we've taken the, the track of doing it the way we were told, and every time we've gone into paralysis, we've wired up some circuits that are gonna wanna repeat. And you have to break into that. And that's why COVID was actually such an interesting opportunity for us because it broke into our typical way of doing things. And it's at times when things are broken that, you know, as Leonard Cohen says, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. When something cracks our old way, there may be just a crack for the light to come in. Now, if you want to like come to the Q&A call, see what happens or sign up for the course, because if you spend six weeks and you're in a class that makes you like go into creativity, go into creativity, go into creativity, we may be able to wire up enough stuff that it's going to um, overtake the way you've been operating up to now, which is miserable for you. So it's not very reinforcing. So if you come out of the paralysis and you learn that thing that I figured out in about 2000, paralysis, oh, creative brain, boom. In happiness, in creativity, able to think my way forward, able to think of ways to make a living, uh, able to set the right boundaries. Yeah, it's a process that you learn and I hope you find time for it, but it's very rare to just go from one state without any kind of teaching or environmental um, example to enable us to do that. But you can do it, I promise, it is possible. So Deirdre says, my question is, how do you deal with decision overwhelm? This is what the tiger is dealing with, with the, all the deer. I lost my job and after feeling lost, got so excited by choosing a new, more creative path, but I'm completely overwhelmed by the idea of picking the wrong path. I'll swing from conservation veterinarian to a designer and end up talking myself out of everything. She also said, love your book. Ah. Okay, so here's the thing. The only way your creative path starts to feel like the wrong thing is that the left side of your brain panics. So the little Dolores character, the panicky one is like, oh no, we've never done it this way before. And that's not the way mom did it. And that's not the way we did it at school. That, that's gotta be wrong. And then the procedural brain goes, oh yes, there must be something wrong. Let's look for the, what's, what's the right thing to do? I had several coaching sessions this last couple of weeks with people who are like, I've got to pick the right thing. They're already doing it. And then I said, what brings you joy? And they tell me with so much energy and love and light. And I'm like, okay, that's the right thing. And they're like, but nobody else is doing it. Exactly. In the world that is being formed right now, no two people have, no two people have ever done exactly the same thing. That's an illusion, that an ideal that was put forth by a society that would love us all to conform. But um, the whole idea that something's wrong and that going from different, uh, you know, from this job to that job, to this task, to this person, and 
those are all cultural ideas that there's a wrong way to go. Ask a river if it's going the wrong way, you know? If it turns at a certain place, it does it stop and say, oh, I think that's wrong. I was going that way, now I'm going that way. Oh, this is dreadful. No, it flows where nature wants it to flow. And when we're in the creative mindset, we're, we become part of nature and we flow where our nature wants us to flow. And the intelligence of nature is so much smarter than the conformist, structured, step one, step two, step three, social reality. It's just, it's not even a comparison. Like your nature is a genius and it will take you the right direction, I promise you. You just have to calm down the left side of your brain, go, honey, it's good. Uh, go read Jill Wolte Taylor's books. Um, and keep choosing the creativity mindset. By the way, Jill, who is a scientist, like a hardcore scientist, lives on a boat. And when she wants to, when she feels like she's getting overwhelmed by the left side of her brain, she paints pictures. That's one of the things I do too. And it was so fun to learn that she's got a pig pen painting pictures on a boat. And I've got a pig pen painting pictures in my house. And it's like, it's like this connection of our true natures flowing the same direction. And it hasn't been bad for our lives. Danielle says, my question is this, can this shift into the right side of our brains help with grief? Absolutely. It's so interesting what the, the right side of the brain does with anger, with fear, and with sadness. It makes things of beauty out of them. I was thinking about Adele when she came on the scene and she won all these Grammys, like for this, her debut album, it was just like unbelievable. And she got up to get her Emmy and she said, all I did was have one crap relationship and feel really bad about it. And I wrote like nine songs about it and everybody's like, oh, that's so good. If you listen to songs like um, Eric Clapton's song, uh, Tears in Heaven, about the death of his son, it's so beautiful, speaking of Grammy winning, winning songs. And I'm not saying that it makes it okay. Grief is always painful and I'm not trying to make light of it. But I am trying to make beauty of it because we all grieve. We all have cause to grieve in this life. And if grief and fear and anger can be sources of beauty and justice and the creation of better things, then that makes them meaningful. And that's how I want to experience the difficult parts of my life. Okay, Ellen says, can you be too much in the right side of your brain? Well, when Jill had her stroke, she had no left brain left. So she couldn't talk. She didn't recognize anyone. And yeah, that's not ideal. So um, she says she built back over eight years. She deliberately through exercise of the brain reconstructed enough of the left side of her brain to function in society. But she said, I stopped without the emotional baggage. I stopped without my fear of the future and my regret about the past. I left a lot of my old left hemisphere behind me. And now I just dabble in it <laughs> because honestly, the place you want to live is the right side. Live on the right side and use the left side. The left side is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Okay, so um, one last question. This is about Ro, uh, the wonderful, gracious badger. Rowan has just finished her book, uh, has just finished her book after years of work. How did she overcome that inability, procrastination, to complete it finally? Living with you, what did you advise her or she can answer? So she wrote, I don't want to answer, but you can. So what I saw was her fighting with the left side of her brain. Ah! Because she made a promise and she wrote a contract with Liz Gilbert that said, I will send you a finished manuscript on this date, like seven months in the future. And she would report in every Sunday. So that's the left side of the brain. So she's getting procedural because she's good about that. But then she would panic. Like, so... The, the due date for her pages was always Sunday. She would get progressively more terrified throughout the week. And then on, on Saturday, she'd say, I simply cannot do it. I can't do it, but I, I have to. And on Sunday, at the bitter end, she would flip on the right side of her brain, which is, I am telling you, something. And she would churn out like 3,000 of the most beautiful words I'd ever seen. I just want to tell you guys, because I'm gonna, I'm just gonna brag on Maroi that when she finished that book through all this anguish and, and like fighting her left brain and then turning on her creativity mindset, which I think is how she's finally gone back into it. We've been talking about the course so much. Anyway, um, 
Liz took the whole manuscript, came to meet us at a restaurant, put the manuscript down and said, this is a bow down moment. I am bowing down to you. This is a brilliant novel. It was pretty awesome, but it made her even more scared to go back in and try to you know, get it ready for publication. So as I've mentioned, we're doing this course, Practical Wayfinding in June, and we've been talking about it, developing the curriculum and it flipped on the right side of her brain. And by God, she's doing her editing and sending it out to agents. So, hey, it's working for Roe. <laughs> work for me, maybe it'll work for you too. Come to the Q&A call and um, you can see whether you will benefit from it. Sorry, I started a couple of minutes early, late, so I went a couple of minutes late. Uh, yeah, the Q&A call is Tuesday, June 1st, and you can check the comments for the link. And remember to bring your questions about the creativity mindset and how it can cure overwhelm in your life. Love you people. Can't wait to see you later. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Go to the right side of your brain and hang out. Mwah. End. Hmm. End. End.